we need to discuss arguing in a formal writing setting. Now, a, a written argument, or any other formal argument, is not a simple matter of screaming at the other person and calling them names. This is a very formal process, and we'll run through it real, through this uh, presentation. So, argument is based on claims. And those claims themselves are arguable. Now, what that means is that they are statements which reasonable people could disagree about. Okay. Now, there are some things, of course, which you cannot argue. For instance, verifiable statements of fact. If I can just look it up in an encyclopedia or an atlas or a textbook or anywhere and find it to be a fact, then it can't be argued. Issues of faith or belief can also not be argued. Okay. You may disagree with somebody on their faith or their beliefs, but you cannot actually argue it because an argument is something which can be solved. Now, this is why a statement of fact can't be argued. It's because it's already been solved. Now, statements of faith or belief, it doesn't matter what evidence you present, you will never be able to change someone's belief that there is or is not a God, that their method of worshiping said God is or is not right. Okay. Matters of faith and belief are so highly personal, we can't really argue them because there is no one correct answer to strive towards. See, faith, by its very definition, can never be proven. Belief is anything that you hold to be true, which is not based in fact. Okay, so you don't believe your name is whatever your name is, okay? You know that. Okay, you know it to be true. The very definition of belief is that it is something which is held to be true despite any evidence which could prove it to be true or false. You see, you cannot prove God exists. Likewise, you cannot prove God does not exist. That's the way it works. You either believe God exists or you don't. Okay? Now, another thing you can't argue, cannot argue, is a matter of simple opinion. Okay? Taste. Things like vanilla ice cream is better ice cream than strawberry ice cream. Well, that might be your personal taste, might not, but it does not, there's no meat to that subject, so there's nothing really to argue about. Oh, what do you know? I actually used that uh, example in the PowerPoint. Ice cream flavors, music, personal taste. Music's a great example. We listen to different genres of music. We all have different favorites. So which one of us is right? None of us. Personal taste. Well, you may not choose to dress exactly the same way someone else does. Does that make you right or does it make them right? Neither one. Okay. Now, if there is a basis in an identifiable criteria then they can be argued. Okay, now what that means is, you know, you could say, orange ruffy is the best fish. Well, not really. That's not arguable. But if you said, orange ruffy is the best fish because it has 89 calories per serving and no saturated fats, well, that at least can be argued. See, the first one, the first statement, orange ruffy is the best fish, because it doesn't have any identifiable criteria, it just comes down to taste. Do you like the taste of orange ruffy or not? The second statement has criteria. How many calories per serving? 
and does it have saturated fats? That can then be argued. Okay. So when you're arguing, you are allowed to begin with an opinion. I mean, you have them, so you're allowed to use them. For instance, you could start with something like, I think boxing is more dangerous than it was 100 years ago. Okay. Now, that's not a claim. And if you remember, an argument begins with a claim. And it's not reasonable, meaning it's not based on reasons. But you can start there. Okay, now that's not going to be your argument itself, but at least gets the ball rolling, because we can transform that. Also, it's not informed. There's no data to support the statement. So we turn that statement into a question. Is boxing more dangerous now than it was 100 years ago? Now we've introduced a question which can lead to research that then supports or or fails to support an argument. Okay, So by researching that question, you can then turn your facts to form support for your argument. Okay. Now, getting back to that one, if you were to use something like that as a as a basis for your claim. You know, is boxing more dangerous now than it was a hundred years ago? You might find that um, because they're wearing gloves now and they weren't wearing gloves in most professional fights a hundred years ago, you might think that, well, that makes it more dangerous a hundred years ago. So therefore the claim is refuted. But then you might find that because they weren't wearing gloves, they didn't take as many headshots. And you say, might think that, well, that supports the claim. You have to do more than just one or two little pieces of research. You have to do some reasoned thinking and follow up things. But you might have to find, with this as an example, that the reason gloves were originally introduced was to protect the boxer's hands from breaking when they struck the other boxer. Because they didn't have those protective gloves on some time ago, they didn't punch the head nearly as often because it's almost all bone and they didn't want to break their hands. Now you might say, well, that therefore supports it. Well, that means that they also had more body shots and you have a lot of internal organ damage. Likewise, today's boxing matches are rarely going to make it all the way to 12 rounds. I remember when they were 15 rounds. It wasn't that many years ago. And in the past, they were an unlimited number of rounds. Okay, So... There's, there's argument on both sides of this. As you can see, maybe if you're beating the hell out of somebody's midsection after 85 or 90 rounds, you're doing more damage than beating the hell out of their head for 12 rounds. You know, This is something which could be argued because there are stances that reasonable people can take on both sides. Now you have to qualify your claim. Because if it's only true some of the time, it doesn't quite really work. And therefore, you've got to qualify things. Is it only true in certain conditions? Okay, is it only true for one group or groups or individuals? Okay, so... If you're going to say that, again, boxing was safer a hundred years ago well for who you know and how so and under what conditions you have to make a lot of qualifications because if you just generalize you might make a false statement inadvertently but you might make a false statement okay next we have to deal with your thesis statement now, it can be formed after the claim has been focused and appropriately qualified. 
Your focus question can be the meat of your thesis, but it cannot be the thesis statement itself. Please remember that a thesis statement is a statement and therefore not a question. Next. Right. Use reasons to support your claims. Okay. If you link your reason to the claim with because, that's good. Okay, so your claim plus the word because plus your reason is how you do that. And that's to answer the question, why? Okay, so if you, if you claim that, you know, boxing was safer 100 years ago, why? Well, boxing was safer 100 years ago because there were less headshots. Or if you claim it was more dangerous, you know, boxing was more dangerous 100 years ago because there were an unlimited number of rounds. You have to use evidence to support your reasons. You can't just pull your evidence out of thin air, and you can't just make statements that aren't backed up by evidence. Now, several types of evidence are likely needed to persuade your audience. Facts are those things which have been proven to be true. They're indisputable. Statistics, those are numerical data produced through research surveys or polls. And they have to be relevant. Okay, I can find a very interesting statistic that says that, you know, four out of five people think boxing is a, uh, a, a rough sport. You know, well, that's nice. Does that actually support or refute the claim that it was safer 100 years ago? No. Okay. Your statistics have to be current. So if the study was done back in, you know, 1950 or whatever, you need to see if there's a more current study. Because if there is, those are the stats you have to use. Now, if there's nothing more current than your early than the one you found, that's fine. They also have to be from a reliable source. Okay, that dude at the corner of the street told me is not a reliable source. Likewise, a polling agency which was hired and created specifically by an industry firm is probably not your best bet. Okay, um, some years back, the um, the truth in advertising was far less. Okay, if you go back to like the early twentieth century there was a lot less truth in advertising. And what that means is they said stuff on advertisements that didn't necessarily hold true. They could say pretty much anything. And they did. And they would tell you things like um, four out of five doctors say that camel cigarettes are the best cigarettes to smoke. That was an old commercial. It literally was. And it was, it was a research firm created by the makers of Camel Cigarettes who pulled five doctors who smoked and gave them Camel Cigarettes to say four out of five, you know, to say that Camel Cigarettes are the best cigarettes. That's not a reliable source. Okay. If you go with something that is less than trustworthy in their sourcing, that makes your entire argument invalid. Okay. You can use examples, which are specific illustrative instances. Okay. It's when something actually happened. It's not a hypothetical. It's not like when you say, well, for instance, this could happen, blah, blah, blah. You know, there, there's no for instance here. It has to be a real world example, one which you can cite and somebody else can look it up and find it. 
you can use the words of authorities who are experts on that topic. Okay. So if you were to go back to our, our boxing paper example, and you find that sports physicians are saying it's more or less dangerous now than it was a hundred years ago, you can cite their data. Now, of course, you have to cite it properly using in-text citations and, you know, put them in the work cited, but, you know, you can use their data. It's fine. Now, they have to be reputable. Again, those four out of five doctors who said camel cigarettes are the best are not reputable because they were paid by the company who makes camel cigarettes. They have to be trustworthy. They have to be qualified to address the issue. Simply because you have the word doctor in front of your name doesn't mean you're actually qualified to address an issue. And then there are anecdotes, which are brief narratives, which are believable and continue contribute to your argument. Anecdotes are okay, but should not be the main portion of your argument. Um, often anecdotes wind up reading like you're just making it up as you go along and they weaken your argument. Scenarios and hypothetical situations can be used, but again, they often read like you're just making it up as you go along. Now, hypotheticals are your what ifs, let's assume, suppose, okay? Much better evidence comes from things like case studies and observations. These are real world researchers doing actual observation of what's going on or actually studying a case. They're very in-depth examinations. And because of the because of the care that the researchers take, they wind up being very detailed and very valuable to contributing to an argument. You can use textual evidence such as quotes, paraphrases, summaries. You can use visuals. Those are things like charts and graphs and so on. Now you have to convince the reader that you're trustworthy. If you don't come across as trustworthy, unbiased and even handed, you will fail to persuade your reader. Okay. You have to be trustworthy. Now you first you build common ground. You know, you talk you you have values that you and your reader share and you incorporate viewpoints of others because if you don't if you exclude those viewpoints then it seems like you have not actually considered all the data you have to at least acknowledge that other viewpoints exist and you have to accommodate for their viewpoints that shows that you've actually taken the time to look over everything now then you can refute their viewpoint and that means you show why it's not as correct as your viewpoint. And again, this isn't done by calling names or anything like that. This is done by supporting your viewpoint. Now, we need to avoid fallacies, which we'll go over in depth in another presentation. But very briefly, you have to avoid ad hominem fallacies. These are attacks that uh, attack the character of a person and not the actual issues. The bandwagon appeal. This is uh, the type of thing where other people are doing it, so we should do it too. Uh, avoid begging the question and circular arguments. Okay, These assume true what needs to be proven. Avoid either or arguments or false dilemmas. These are oversimplification with only two options. Avoid false analogy, which is comparing two things which resemble one another, but ignoring the most important aspects. Okay. Avoid uh, faulty causality, post hoc, ergo propter hoc, after this, therefore, because of this. This assumes that because one thing happens after another one happened, the first one caused the second. Okay. We'll go into detail on these in a different, uh, different lecture. 
Avoid the straw man. This is when you misrepresent the opposition by making their position extreme. And when you make something extreme, it's ridiculous. And avoid hasty generalizations. These are conclusions based on insufficient evidence. The slippery slope should be avoided. This is when you assert that one event definitely will lead to another. Okay, you can't, can't do that one. Now, you can appeal to the reader's emotions. It may be necessary in order to make the reader connect with what you're writing. But you should do it sparingly. If you overdo it, your reader begins to feel manipulated. Now, we have primary sources and secondary sources. Primary sources are the original work, and secondary sources are interpretations of the original work. Okay, it's that simple. You have scholarly versus popular. Okay, scholarly sources are written by academics and are peer-reviewed. Popular sources are pretty much everything else. Uh, to find your sources, go to the library. And you're just going to go to epcc.edu slash library. Or you go to my.epcc.edu and then look for the services and then library. Um, remember that plagiarism is using someone else's ideas, words, or images without proper attribution. In an argument, you're going to be depending on other people's images, words, ideas. So you have to cite them both in the text, that's when you introduce it, and in the work cited. Any non-attributed quotes, non-attributed paraphrases, summaries, images, mixing quotations and paraphrases, mixing summaries and quotations, all of that is plagiarism. And you need to understand that plagiarism isn't just cheating, it's theft of intellectual property. Open source and public domain have to be attributed also. So just because something comes from something like Wikipedia, which is open source public domain, you still have to cite it. Somebody wrote that. That's their intellectual property. You probably shouldn't be using Wikipedia at this stage. It's not a bad launching point to find things, but it's not your ending point. Okay. So that's it for this presentation. Um, if you need anything, if you have any questions, get a hold of me using my email, anelso17 at epcc.edu. Stop using Blackboard Messenger. Please. Thank you.